So it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance. I slightly changed the title, but the topic is the same. Um, so I'll talk about the transfer uh, near the quantum critical point. This is an old problem, uh, but uh, I hope to share some new results, new perspective. It uh, started actually just a month ago for me. Uh, I was uh, enjoying the program at Aspen that Amy, Pierce, and Sri put together, and they give me an opportunity to think about the uh, enigmas in Canada's metaphysics, so it started just by thinking about some old problems. So I'll give you uh, just a reminder about the uh, superconducting quantum phase transitions and some best studied examples, which is uh, let's say a because of Garikov model with magnetic disorder. I'll talk about superconducting films subjected to in-plane field. Uh, my talk is about multiband metals. I will give you uh, one model that is analytically tractable. Uh, I'll spend a good chunk of time just reviewing uh, an important old work that set the stage for this problem. Uh, I'll prepare a couple of slides as motivation for the experiment, and then uh, this would follow with a uh, discussion of uh, new results. Uh, all right, so the I think the first example of uh, superconductor metal uh, quantum phase transition uh, dates back to the work of Abrikosov and Garkov. They considered a uh, conventional superconductor contaminated by magnetic disorder, uh, and so they derived the result for their uh, renormalized transition temperature uh, as captured by the parameter alpha in their theory, which is just uh, linearly proportional to the concentration of magnetic impurities and the spin flip transitions for electrons drive TC to zero. So the plot is not in their paper, but the equation is. Uh, and so this can be solved for a new TC as a function of alpha. And there is a critical value uh, uh, in the concentration that drives transition temperature to zero. And, and it vanishes non-analytically with this uh, parameter uh, as a square root of uh, deviation from the critical value uh, of the, uh, of the uh, parameter. Uh, so there are a few other examples where essentially the same phase diagram appears. Uh, these uh, examples have been considered primarily due to the studies of superconductor twins all the later transition in disordered films. So if we would take a film of certain thickness and subject it to the in-plane magnetic field, we can actually suppress superconductivity by two mechanisms for intermediately or sufficiently thick films. The orbital effect would dominate, so we just insert the flux through the film, uh, and the uh, equation for the reduced TC actually is completely in one-to-one -one correspondence to the recourse of Garkov theory. The only difference is that in this case, the parameter that uh, tune the transition uh, uh, can be changed by the magnitude of the magnetic field. So it just uh, flux through the film thickness. Uh, the equation is the same. Uh, however, in the ultra thin films, uh, in principle, it's possible to reach a situation when the superconductivity would be limited by the Pauli effect. Uh, and situation here is slightly different. Uh, there is actually a three critical point, and then there is a superheating and supercooling uh, transitions. But nevertheless, uh, qualitatively, it's similar. And you also can ask the questions about the origin of transport near the quantum critical point. So this would be my uh, main interest uh, in this talk, uh, thinking uh, if we approach this critical point from different directions, uh, how quantum fluctuations of the proximity to an emerging superconductive order would influence uh, transport property of the system. I will do that in slightly different model uh, that was proposed by Maxim Vavilov and Andrei Chubukov in early days or initial days of uh, Nick tides. This is a two-band model uh, that captures uh, competing interactions in spin density wave and superconducting channels. It gives rise to S plus minus superconductivity. And in this model, uh, the quantum phase transition is driven by disorder, so by assumption here we will consider non-magnetic impurities, which induce both intraband and interband transitions. And because of the S plus minus uh, nature of the superconductivity that emerges in this uh, model, the interband transitions, they are pair breaking. So these are the transitions that drive TC to zero, uh, and it gives rise to the superconducting quantum critical point. But in principle, the phase diagram is much richer. It gives you magnetic transition and also a region of the coexistence between SDW and superconductivity. So I will 
primarily focus only on this part of the phase diagram, ignoring the complications of our uh, interactions in the ketidine channels. I would like to say that this model, even though it's relatively straightforward and simple, it's very fruitful. Uh, it's been studied and applied to address many other things. For instance, uh, uh, it successfully describes the jump of the specific heat at the transition. Uh, it was applied to model the penetration depth all the way across the phase diagram. Uh, it was modeled to see what happens with TC uh, when you suppress magnetism, which by itself boosts disorder and so on. So it's quite fruitful, captures many physics that is observed experimentally. And I felt that this model is uh, interesting enough to play for, for the transport itself. So this would be my uh, model that I will use. Uh, and a couple of slides of motivations. Uh, so depending whether you like more mesoscopic physics or physics of correlated electrons. So one piece of motivation you could find in this colloquium by uh, Kapitulny, Kivelson, and Spivak who are discussing scenarios when the transition from metal to superconductor of, uh, in the context of superconductor insulator transition can proceed through an intermediate phase that they call an anomalous phase. So in these traces of resistance versus temperature in aluminum, indium, uh, lead films of different thicknesses, you can see that some films go superconducting, some go insulating, but there is some films that does neither, they remain metallic, and their uh, resistivity saturates to a constant value through uh, in some cases, a clear kind of plateau feature, almost temperature independent plateau at lowest temperature. Sometimes it saturates with some temperature dependence, but the nature of this anomalous metal phase is not uh, completely understood. This plot is for one of the cuprates, so it's seen across the variety of spectrum of different materials that exhibits this transition. And then uh, there are similarly, I think, related questions that people ask in the context of correlated electrons. So this would be one of the cuprates when, again, the phase diagram is more complex. We have a couple of nodes. We can dope the system, raise the system in magnetic field, and the resistance uh, really changes depending on which part of the phase diagram you're in. So let's say for this couple of panels that I've shown, these are plots taken at the same magnetic field, so with, with six Tesla somewhere here, but the doping level, let's say 0 0.15, 0 0.17 correspond to a different points across the phase boundary. And then all of a sudden uh, you transition from T linear resistance to quadratic thermoliquid like resistance and so on. So you can ask question how fluctuations near the phase boundaries affect transport properties. So there are, I think, lots of motivations. Okay, so here is kind of a cartoonish way. So suppose that we have some model, uh, you choose your model that you like. Uh, and then we ask the question, if I go this path, I go this path, I go this path, what the result would be. I'll try to convince you that the result is different. Uh, and I'll try to provide reasons why. Uh, we do know quite a bit uh, about the transport near the classical phase transitions. And I will review this for you in the next couple of slides. But extrapolating this all the way to the zero temperature is something that is uh, much less studied in the literature. All right, so to set the stage in some terminology, um, I would like to, I will approach this problem in the following sense. I'll start with the metallic side and the disordered metal. So we have the conductivity at lowest temperatures, and then I will crank up interactions and try approaching the quantum critical point. And I would like to perturbatively uh, include interactions in the Cooper channel and see what they give me to the, uh, as a corrections to the conductivity. So this approach is, a uh, Fermi analogy approach uh, has been uh, used uh, for many years, and there is a following hierarchy of different contributions. So it first was studied by Aslamazov Larkin, it goes by their name, so Aslamazov Larkin contributions. This is a contribution to conductivity due to the thermally excited Cooper pairs. So the Maki Thompson contribution uh, is interaction driven quantum interference effect. It resembles recalculation physics, but it's really driven by interactions. Uh, uh, about the same time, Abraham's radio Wu also considered the density of states effect. So in order to create uh, fluctuation-induced Cooper pairs, we take them from a Fermi C. So it means that we deplete states near the Fermi level. So density of states diminishes. This typically leads to a negative corrections to the conductivity. And then later on, I think these type of diagrams that are abbreviated as DCR, they're called diffusion constant renormalization. They, for the first time, appeared in this paper. I think, and they are hybrids of Aslamazov-Larkin and 
and Maki Thompson. So there are basically some um, Kubo bubbles with Cooperon letters uh, and interaction lines. I probably should also explain some building blocks. So each straight line is a disordered average Green's function. Wavy lines are pair propagator in the Cooper channel. And these shaded uh, triangles or rectangles are Cooper letters uh, of the impurity line. So you consider interactions in the presence of uh, diffusive uh, disorder scan. All right. So the goal is to use this in the quantum regime and, and see what happens. <clears throat> All right. So of course, I'm not the first one to think about this. And I will give you a few examples from the literature. So I think the first, to my mind, work that addressed transport was from the work of uh, Rivas and Pierce. So they exactly consider the generic model of, let's say, 2D superconductor to 2D metal transition. They used the because of Gerkov theory. They uh, derived an effective action for the fluctuating uh, order parameter field. There is um, an emergent propagator here for, for superconducting fluctuations. And they looked at the aslamazov larkin diagram plus some RG arguments in order to extract the conductivity corruption. So, okay, so they calculated several things from self-energy and specific heat. And so what we'd like to take a look is the temperature dependent conductivity in 2D, which they found the correction term to be inversely proportional to temperature. All right, so I'll come back to comment uh, on this result just in a second. Uh, so then there was a work uh, from Miniev and Sigrist uh, uh, soon after that, they considered essentially the same model with slight different motivation. In their case, the transition was driven by pressure. They thought about the heavy fermion uh, materials, but they also considered uh, just a classical version of the aslamazov larkin diagram. Uh, if you look at the pair propagator, it's exactly the same form as in the Pierce case. Uh, so if we just transform the Matsubara frequency to dd time, uh, gradient is the Q square term. So it's essentially the same result. Yet they arrived to different conclusions. So we need to distinguish two regimes. One I will call a classical regime when temperature is higher than the detuning from the quantum critical point or quantum regime when temperature is actually smaller than detuning to the quantum critical point. So they found that in each of these regimes, so in quantum regime, this uh, aslamazov larkin term vanishes quadratically with temperature. And it crosses over to a T-linear behavior at slightly higher temperatures. Yeah, and I think in order to reconcile uh, with the Pierce statement, at least in my understanding, uh, I think that Pierce result is actually corresponding to a classical regime when you substitute this detuning by T squared. The propagator contains this extra piece here. So this one over T is actually a higher temperature tail of the behavior when you move away from the quantum critical point rather than the transition near it, uh, uh, near that point. Um, so I will explain you that these uh, statements are half correct uh, for technical reasons that I will also explain to you, but let's just keep in mind that classical aslamazov larkin in their statement is vanishing, yes. In here, no, but we will later on, we will be able to do that. Um, so then there was a work by Igor Herb but uh, slightly later, he again used the uh, bosonic action approach. He derived Ginsburg Landau. Again, the action itself is again very similar to what Pierce wrote and Minev used in their time dependent Ginsburg Landau. So he also calculated conductivity. He says that the T to zero case uh, conductivity is uh, given by the, okay, in weak disorder by Druda expression, but exactly at the quantum particular point at the Gaussian level, he arrived at the following correction. And this following correction is 4 e squared over h times a universal function. And this universal function, in his case, depends on the particle hole asymmetry. So let's little simplify matters. Take particle hole symmetry case. This f naught is just a constant. So his statement that uh, at the quantum critical point at t to 0 limit, the conductivity is universal. So number times e squared over h. So this is at least in contradiction to the previous examples that I've showed you. Ah, so then uh, there was, so these three examples are bosonic action approach. Uh, this is more uh, diagrammatic approach uh, by these people. Uh, they used the model of the P wave superconductor with conventional disorder. Uh, it mimics the same phase diagrams in physics. They found instead that at the critical point, 
Aslamaza Flarkin has uh, divergent logarithmic corrections, and they commented that Maki Thompson and those diagrams were irrelevant and they're vanishing at zero temperature. Uh, um, so these are problematic results, again, for reasons that I will explain in a few minutes, uh, not only because we missed some of the other important contributions, but uh, uh, so we will uh, we will come back to some of those terms in a second. Oops. Sorry. Uh, gosh. Sorry. Uh, all right. And uh, okay, so this then I, I need to mention this paper as well that at least for me added much more confusion. I still I was in preparation for the stock was thinking hardly what to say about this paper. Uh, but uh, this is again a bosonic action exactly in the same form as Igor used in his work. Uh, the intent was to generalize this to thermoelectric transport near the spare breaking phase transitions. They discussed that generically you expect a universal scaling form of your conductance uh, as a detuning from the critical point. It may, uh, we can discuss also optical conductivity as the result may decay on the cutoff in your theory on particle hole asymmetry. And they pointed out that the result depends on the order of limits that you would take. So for instance, according to the table of results, if you sit exactly at criticality, so your tuning parameter is at critical, so this variable is out of the equation, then whether you want to discuss T to the uh, temperature to zero first at optical at finite frequency or finite frequency at zero temperature, the results are different. But the thing is that even though they used exactly the same formalism as eager, they arrived at different conclusions. So uh, try to make your own mind. In particular, if you take frequency first, they find log T divergence. And furthermore, the result is dependent on the uh, particle hole asymmetry parameter eta. So uh, they are not uh, in agreement with the previous results to, to add uh, a more, a more confusion. So just about the same time, um, I sort of was working in a related problem. And we knew for a very long time, actually going back to the work of Eliasberg and Garikov, that pure bosonic time-dependent ginzburg landau action does not capture or interaction corrections to conductivity. So for instance, it was known that it's okay to use it to capture Aslamaz of Larkin, but it misses all of the interference and density of states contributions. So I spent quite a lot of time to trying to figure it out in the classical regime and we fixed it, uh, but it's not only captured at the action level. So you need to be very careful at modifying expression for the current and writing corrections to the current. So you could do all of that, but your bosonic theory becomes non-local and it's actually not easier to use than just the diagrammatic technique. And if we already know that there are issues with using just purely bosonic actions of the classical regime fluctuations, surely we'll have a similar problems in the quantum regime as well. So this needs to be treated very carefully. All right, uh, so another final example is that there is um, a version of this problem in the perpendicular magnetic field where quantum regime would occur at, uh, in the, near the upper critical field. This is perhaps the most studied problem going back to work of Larkin Galitsky and then many others, Varlamov uh, uh, and Landau group and uh, Sasha Finkelstein and others. So I think this limit is settled and people calculated there are many, many regimes that needs to be addressed in quantum, quantum classical crossover to classical regimes. And there are many diagrams to calculate uh, uh, many results uh, to follow. So let me guide you through uh, of the complications. So this is just to tell you that I've done some work uh, I was living, when I was living uh, Aspen office, I, I was just trying to uh, organize my notes, there's some stacks of notes. So just to tell us that I, I've done some work, okay? Um, so let me explain why there are problems in just doing simple things. So let's say if we would concentrate on just, I will give you one diagram, but the argument applies to everything else. So let's say we will look at the Slamaz of Larkin. So basic blocks are these triangular vertex functions that are dressed by these disorder uh, cuperons interaction lines in another triangle. So let's say in the Kubo, when we inject the finite frequency, we'd like to calculate the current Carolin correlation function. So now, uh, so epsilons are fermionic energies that are running in the loops, uh, and omegas are bosonic frequencies that enter in the pair property. Now, in the classical regime, where we're near TC, the typical energy scale of bosonic modes, the softness, is T minus TC, so it's how close you are to a transition line. But fermionic energies are of the order of T. And because T minus TC is much smaller than T, 
It means that in every loop where you see fermionic frequency, you can neglect bosonic modes at all completely. So in classical regime, these triangular blocks, they have no dynamical structure. They are just constants. Uh, and this triagonal block is just linearly proportional to momentum because this is the current vertex. But in quantum regime, it is not the case. When you drive to C to zero, every single frequency is of the order of T. So you have no this luxury and this vertex function, they're dynamical and you need to worry about this quite a big deal. And, and then by analytical structure, when you uh, continue this to real frequency, these objects, they have different causal structure. They are either retarded, retarded, or advanced, advanced, or retarded, advanced. And you need to keep track of all of those things. And they're all of the same order, okay? Second of all, uh, the pair propagator does not have a pole structure. So if you take a T to zero limit, and you remember some limits of these gamma functions, it is actually a branch cut. And this also makes some differences. So you need to be careful in how you treat the interaction lines as well. So all of that makes things a bit more complicated. So uh, this is just one slide again to show that I've done some work. There are four different kinds of Haslamas of Larkin Tor. And I call some of them to be classical and some of them to be quantum. And this depends which block you would expand over the external frequency. So since I'd like to do a DC conductivity, I would eventually expand over omega to linear order. And I can expand propagators, I can expand Green's functions, or I can expand these triagonal blocks. So they appear from very different uh, pieces. So there are four different kinds of Aslamaz of Larkin diagram. So the classical one uh, that comes uh, from expanding the propagator, indeed, like in many of Sigrist, uh, vanishes um, quadratically. And this is in the limit when temperature is smaller than the detuning from the quantum critical point. So delta here in my theory is just uh, some control parameter uh, detuned from the critical value of the parameter. But then the other thing is that there are these quantum corrections to them, and some of them do not actually vanish as the function goes to zero. And furthermore, some of them have different signs. So all, all together, uh, the Aslamaz of Larkin term at zero temperature happens to be finite positive and universal in the sense that of the order of E square over H with some number. Uh, and then it crosses over to primarily T-linear behavior at temperatures that are above the uh, quantum critical gap, but still much, much smaller than TC at uh, bare TC. But this is not the end of the story. Uh, as I told you, there are many more diagrams to calculate. So, ah, yeah, okay, so this is a summary for all of them. So not all of the Aslamaz of Larky term vanish. They have different contributions, different sign. Overall, it's positive correction. Quantum limited uh, is dominated by vertex corrections, actually, and uh, it's li uh, leading to linear behavior at finite temperatures. Uh, uh, but then we need to do all of the rest, uh, and um, it turns out that all of the rest cancels uh, this positive Aslamaz of Larkin, the total at zero temperature uh, and at critical uh, quantum critical point is negative. Um, and again, there are different kinds of crossovers depending on whether you took it what is called regular uh, or anomalous. So the answer is the following. Um, if I would go back to my phase diagram, uh, then uh, I wanted to tell you the following. The temperature dependence is non-monotonic, and it depends at which angle you approach the quantum critical point. So if you sit at zero temperature and you move towards quantum critical point from the side of your tuning parameter, you would get negative corrections, and they are intra, uh, infrared convergent, so they don't sense the, how close you are. They remain finite, and they are universal of the order of E square over H. Uh, then if you start approaching with the angle, there is a non-trivial crossover from negative to positive corrections. If you are in this corner in the classical to quantum crossover, the corrections are positive. And if you are approaching all the way at the critical line, but from the high temperature side is also positive and also universal of the order of E squared over H. Okay, so this line is very difficult to calculate because it's really non-perturbative, but I, I think this is what has happened through this uh, relations. Uh, all right, so that's more or less uh, all of the technical details for this old Enigma story. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank my friends to be patient trying to check my factors and everything to Maxim Porras from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Ma Maxim, who've tried to check many things numerically, 
and the longtime friend uh, yeah, and sort of teacher in this uh, business of uh, fluctuations, uh, Andrei Verlanov, whom, whom I picked up lots of technical details. So thank you so much. Thank you.